at nine. Right now, though, even in Edwardian times, you could find the occasional female petrol head. In 1905, a young woman set out to prove that a member of her fair sex could drive an automobile from London to Liverpool and back in just two days without the aid of a mechanic. Dorothy Levitt took her little dog Dodo and a loaded revolver in the glove compartment. And all to prove that the road was not owned by men. In this programme, I will be looking back to the origins of motoring in Britain. Can you hold that for me? Yes, thank indeed. you. Gosh, that's dirty. I'll leave you to it. And I will uncover the story of one of motoring's most unusual trailblazers. Dorothy didn't have to cope with overtaking traffic. Nor them zooming past you that way either. Whoa! Bring back horses to the farms. Along the way, I'm going to find out just what it must have been like to be a motoring pioneer. I think I've taken a wrong turning. From struggling with the gears of a classic de Dion Bouton. I like that. <laughs> I'll yes. see if I can let it out totally this time. We shall better get out of my way. Um, so we have to driving in the full regalia of Edwardian so motoring so fashion. Oh, it's a ghastly colour. I don't think I'd wear it. Fingers crossed. Right. Choke. Oh, wonderful. And of course, facing the challenge of steering a veteran car along some of the same British roads <laughs> that Dorothy Levitt used more than a century ago. In this car, you really feel you're travelling. Dorothy Levitt was one of the Edwardian era's most famous and glamorous racing drivers. I'm on a quest to find out more about her and to discover what Britain was like when cars were just a newfangled invention. Exactly a century ago, most people didn't realize that cars would eventually transform the world. They thought that they were merely annoying playthings for the rich and famous. During the Edwardian period, cars were owned by the rich. You had to have an income of at least a thousand a year, which puts you in the very, very top bracket. Edward VII was a great fan of the motor car. He had one very early on, and he would motor down to Sandring with a, with a tartan rug over his knees, and he used to get absolutely furious if anybody overtook him. It was a thrill beyond almost anything that you can visualise. Almost like sort of space travel today, as it were. Manufacturers at the time, such as Daimler, were producing adverts which compared the car to the horse to show why owning a Daimler could be such a good thing. It wouldn't die on the job. It wouldn't produce manure, which, as the advert said, would poison the air. You didn't need a stable for it, and so on. I can remember reading somewhere in a motoring magazine that if you didn't get on terribly well with your neighbour, it didn't matter when you got a car, because you could easily bowl along 10, 15 miles and call on somebody else. If Dorothy didn't like her neighbours, she could get away from them really quickly because she was one of the first fast ladies. In 1903, she became the first woman to compete in a motor race, and that's just a month after learning to drive. On the open road, cars were restricted to just 20 miles per hour, but Dorothy entered the speed trials and set a new ladies' land speed record of an amazing 91 miles per hour. After that, they called her the fastest girl on earth. She was definitely an it girl. She made headlines and she lived up to her image. She's totally fascinating, and I want to find out more about her. Hello, Anne. Hello. I want to talk to you about Dorothy Levitt, of course. Now, we know so little about her. What do you know? Please tell me. Our main significance is that she was Britain's first woman racing, racing driver. She raced both in the UK, she raced in France, and she raced in Germany. She was spotted by somebody called Selwyn Edge, who was an Australian entrepreneur, motor car, and racing driver himself. And she became what they call a works driver for him. Now, she always competed as an amateur. Yes. Who provided the racing cars? Selwyn Edge? Yes, yes. She used his cars. He wanted her to drive for him. 
for Napier. So he helped to promote her driving career and she helped to promote his cars. What did she live on, Mr Edge? We don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> don't start ugly rumours. I don't know, but she had a flat in the West End, according to her account. She had a little Pomeranian dog, and then she wrote articles. She only wrote one book, uh, which I believe sold very well, called The Women in the Car, yes. a chatty handbook. And her aim, she was part of what I think was known as a woman's right to motor. And she was advocating that even women of, I wouldn't say no means, but of moderate means, could and should afford to drive. It's what they should do. At the dawn of the auto age, women played a very significant role in creating what was to become a car culture. Dubbed motorinas, they fearlessly took the wheel and changed the world. Dorothy Levitt was by no means the only woman driver. There were a lot of women who drove from the minute the car was introduced. Again, a wealthy society, women, novelists, modern, what we might almost call fast women. It was when cars started getting cheaper and when uh, people down the, the social scale were starting to drive cars that, that women were suddenly starting to be seen as challenging the social order. The jokes about the hopeless female motorists started in the Edwardian period. There were cartoons in the motor magazines which would show women in a car smoking with, with a caption saying joyriders. I think there was a lot of male opposition to women drivers, unsurprisingly. Um, I think it was the idea that it was unfeminine somehow. You'd have to be a big brawny Amazon to drive a car. It was very unseemly for a woman. Partly it was the idea that women were fluffy little things and they would never understand what went on under a bonnet of a car. Many of the photographs that you see of motorinas in cars are there for show. They weren't actually driving them, they were sitting there uh, posing. So women were in some ways their own worst enemies. They lived up to these, to these male stereotypes, but of course men were appallingly patronising as they've always have been about women drivers. Well, Dorothy didn't have much time for fripperies. She was totally focused on the art of driving. If I'm going to follow in Dorothy's tyre tracks from here to Liverpool, I think I need a copy of that book of hers. There we go. That's just the one. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Let's give you some money. Although the book was written for women of a certain class, much. only the really rich yes, could afford thank motoring. Thank you. Dorothy believed passionately that no all women thought. should be allowed to drive. It's like the AA manual, the auto mechanic and Vogue, all rolled into one. But here's an interesting piece. Motoring is a pastime for women. Young, middle-aged, and, if there are any, old. The intense pleasure, the actual realisation of the pastime, comes only when you drive your own car. I think it's about time I got some lessons. During her brilliant career, Dorothy handled every type of car, usually big and powerful ones. But in her book, she recommends the single-cylinder de Dion Bouton as the perfect car for a woman. And to prove it, she chose the French-made car to make her epic journey from London to Liverpool in 1905. So I've come to meet veteran car owner Andrew Howe Davis at Brooklyn's Museum. He's got the unenviable task of teaching me to drive his De Dion car. Good morning, Andrew. Good morning, Penny. I'm, I'm Penny. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you. What were you doing? Anything important? I was just uh, adjusting the carburetor. Right, and is Which it all? Which seems to be a constant fettle. Really? Yes. And this is a De Dion Bouton. This is a 1902 De Dion Type K. Type K. That's important, is it? All very important in the club. And De Dion were made in France. Correct. Whereabouts in France? I can't answer that question. Right. That's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? Right. It is northern France, though. It, yes, right. yes. It'll say it somewhere. Puteau. Oh, well done, yes. This is not your car, is no, it? No, it's not. But all I right. just love reading labels, <laughs> don't you? I find labels <laughs> fascinating. So. What's it like driving a hundred and, well, six-year-old car on the roads today? Uh, very enjoyable. I get a tremendous buzz out of it. I really enjoy it. And you invariably do it with uh, like-minded friends in their cars. You are definitely safer in a group. 
no question about that. Hunting packs. And they're, exactly. And they're, and they're, you always have an empty road in a veteran car because they're all behind you. So how did you acquire this car? Uh, at an auction in Sydney. And I bought it over the phone and it was a very exciting. The heart rate was going. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a rear entrance tonneau body. You get in you the back. You come in here? Oh, You come course. in through the back door. It's all very enjoyable. Oh, and I love the handle. And then there's two lovely little seats inside. Right. Well, what's so lovely about this, if you're in the Brighton run, you have your friends with you and they can supply you with copious amounts of tea Whatever. and coffee. Or if you're that way inclined, a little champagne. I think that might be rather nice, actually. <laughs> So was it all in this sort of state when it arrived from no, Sydney? No, no. It, it, um, it was found in 1957 in a concrete skipyard. The chassis was being used to actually transport cement for making gnomes, I think. In Sydney? In, in Adelaide. Oh, in, a <laughs> in Adelaide. <laughs> gnomes never caught on, but Edwardian motors were so basic you could really pimp your ride with relish. It came in a sort of very basic shape and you added the accessories. So it was a very expensive, rather old-fashioned way of buying a car. You didn't just go to a showroom and buy it and expect to get the whole shooting match there. You didn't have headlights, you wouldn't have a speedometer, you wouldn't have any of these things, and you wouldn't have a windscreen. Cars were thought of in terms of horseless carriages to start with. You had to have stables, not garages, but stables. 1901 when you had to register and license your car I mean up to then you didn't have to have a license plate on it was almost like a boat you know the Jolly Roger you'll just paint your name aside so it wasn't for some time that you actually had to have a, a number plate in Edwardian days if you'd wanted nodding dogs in your car you'd have needed to take real ones so it's best to get in from here fine right it's quite comfortable it's lovely, actually, far more comfortable than quite a lot of cars I know. Right, you're going to explain all these levers, will uh, you? Yes, I will. Keep it basically simple. You're going to have this. This lever down here gives you a pre-selector the gearbox. You'll select which range of gears you'd like to be in. So, I want to go up a steep hill, or do I want to cruise on the roads? I want to cruise on the roads. You road. want to cruise on the roads, right. so you would push it into the position it's in now, which right. gives you second and third gear. Now, can right. cover everything on a normal day's outing. Right. And these two. And here, this is for running the engine more efficiently and uh, sweetly and economically. And then, and then this one. And underneath, this is the offside rule in football. I this... don't do football, I do cricket. Well, yes, well, you'll have a lot of trouble with that lever. <laughs> so can I leave that one? <laughs> no, that's a very important lever. Oh, how often would I have to use that? You'd be tiddling with that virtually all the time. Really? Just a little bit. Oh. It's much simpler than it looks when you're driving. Yes, now you say me, but I think I would like to sit in the car with you while you drive it. Okay. So can I get out? Yes, please. And then you come and drive me around and I'll see what it feels like. Okie dokie. All right, well, what I'm going to do is obviously start the car. Oh, yes, of course. Switch on. It's a light switch, isn't it? It is really? a light switch, yes. yes. And then we turn it around so it engages, push it in, and lift it up. Open that. Open that up. Right. Let's tuck the petrol in. And away we go. <laughs> now, it's, now it's running at a happy ticker. Right? Yes. This is a fully retarded position. Gosh. <laughs> then you can slow that right down by just doing that. So, no safety belts. Uh, no safety belts. All the more reason not to hit anything. Yes, exactly. Well, I think what I'll do... I'll just go forward. Well, it's about time we have a go, then, isn't it? Right, OK. Now, I'll release that for you. Right. And here we are. Do I engage the gear first? No. Handbrake off. It's quite a thing, that, isn't it? Oh, yes. Push it Break off. Engage the gear. Push it right forward, and you're fully engaged. Right. Excellent. Right, now just slow down. Put the pedal down a bit. Pedal down a bit. But not down. all the way to the floor, it turns into a brake. You told me that so many times. Right. And then I just trottle along at this speed. Right, the and then I'll turn around. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Let the foot off, and away you go. Right. Gosh! And into neutral. Oh, my word, you certainly stopped. <laughs> yes, I have. And I've got the brake on, and I skidded, I'm sorry. Now, shall I let my foot off? Oh, you can switch it off now. Why switch it off? <laughs> it's good when it stops, isn't it? Isn't it lovely and peaceful? Yes, it's lovely. That's the joy of motoring when it stops. This demands total concentration. I was so worried that I didn't even touch my mixture 
once. And you didn't wave to anybody? No, I didn't. No, gosh. Because it's a very important that? part of veteran car motoring is waving. Oh, waving to people. <laughs> yes, and then I had to be sure that I got everything right, because as I was driving towards the camera, I thought, no, I mustn't kill them. In the early days of motoring, there were very few rules and regulations. In Britain, driving tests didn't come in until the 1930s. You weren't allowed to drive in the park, so people were advised to learn to drive on country roads. And there were, obviously, people who could teach you, or I expect as much as it is today, husbands would teach wives and shout at them. They would learn in their own driveway if they were aristocrats, with the salesman sort of saying, you pull this lever. There was no conventional series of signals to tell people what you were going to do. And in fact, various people ha had different signals telling you what they were going to do. A writer wrote into the car magazine in 1905 suggesting a series of arm movements that motorists would understand. If the motorist held their arm downwards, then that suggested caution. If they held their arm straight ahead, then that suggested there was a speed trap nearby. And if they held their arm upwards, then that suggested that they needed assistance. When Dorothy decided to make the epic two-day trip from London to Liverpool in 1905, her aim was not a frivolous one. Opposition to women as drivers was rife, and she wanted to challenge a widespread male prejudice. At the time, some people thought it shocking for a lady to take charge of a motor car, but Dorothy wanted to prove that a lady, any lady, could drive a one-cylinder car on a long distance and on her own without a mechanic to help. I'm determined to follow Dorothy's journey as closely as I can. Which route would she have planned? She'd probably have followed more or less the line of the modern A5 because that was one of the best roads in the country. So exactly how long did the journey take? She accomplished the journey in two days, ten hours running time each way which was an average of 20 miles an hour, which was the aim of the exercise, but it's still quite a good time for getting to London and Liverpool in a small car. Yes, of course. Now, today we've got sat-navs, we've got motoring maps and everything. How, what would she have had? She would have taken the Contour Road Book, which had been invented for cyclists. It showed all the steep hills, all the hazards en route, and so early motorists almost inevitably would have gone to this. This is part of her route. And as you can see, it gives a contour section of the road, tells you where all the inns are, mechanics. It's rather like a modern AA or RAC handbook. It was said that she went on her own, but in fact there was someone there in the car with her. Yes, but he was only an observer. He was there to make sure that she didn't infringe the rules by having outside help or doing anything that was, shall we say, unprofessional in driving from London Liverpool, like putting the car on a train. Right. So we've got some magazines here, haven't yes. we? I mean, and this shows how successful it was, because these magazines, for their day, they had tremendous circulation. Was, in those days, people who didn't own motor cars bought motoring magazines. It was the aspirational aspect of it. Right, right. So this is the auto car. This is the auto car, which is still going strong. Yes. And this is the Automotor Journal, which is one of its strongest rivals. And she got her photos in here too, didn't she? Yes, you, well, see? see, this was the thing. Lady motorist, look, she's got the bonnet up. She knows where the engine is. Brilliant. It's, it's selling it to the lady motorist. And she became something of a public heroine for having done it. Oh, really? She, she was regarded as... Um, the Im image of lady motorists in her day. Really, really. Dorothy might have been able to handle a car without much help, but most people needed a lot of support. And that's why the Royal Automobile Club was formed. This was set up to promote the cause of, of, of motoring. And at the time, it attracted the elite of motorists. Women were excluded and it was by invitation only. With its great headquarters in Pall Mall, when it became the Parliament of Motoring, it became the great authority about what should happen and it gradually laid down conventions and rules. The RAC helped with 
every aspect of motoring. They licensed hotels, they put up signs to say slow down when there were dangerous hazards. But it was also a, a kind of rich gentleman's club for self-indulgent cigar smoking and rather raffish toffs. The Ladies Automobile Club was set up in 1903 in part because the wealthiest socialite women had been excluded from the automobile club. They met in Claridge's, they had a social time, they got discounts on hotel rooms, gave advice about what to wear, gave technical tips and all this sort of thing. They had a motto and it was ubiqui, which means everywhere in Latin. But of course they weren't everywhere at all. They were hardly anywhere and they were supremely genteel. Motoring in the Edwardian period was as much about fashion and style as it was about technology, something that the Ladies Automobile Club was supremely aware of. So, as well as getting help from fledgling organisations, early motorists spent a lot of time with their tailors and milliners. They were forced to drive their cars with no protection from the elements or choking road dust. So it's no surprise that Dorothy took what a lady should wear seriously. It was a serious business. In her book, she suggests lots of different outfits, all of them practical, such as the need to wear soft kid gloves and a neck muffler. Very necessary. She also, oh, she says, avoid chintz and frills. I always do. I suppose they might get caught in the machinery. I wonder if Isadora Duncan read this book. At the time, Dunhill was one of the leading exponents of motoring fashion for both ladies and gentlemen. I'm hoping that Dunhill's archivist can offer up some tips on how to create the perfect Edwardian motoring outfit for my journey. What would the most important clothes have been for someone who was driving then? I imagine at the time it probably would have been a pair of motoring goggles so you could keep the vision uh, clear. Um, for driving, but also dust coats and for the ladies a wonderful veil and hat uh, so one could keep composure whilst driving and when they got to the destination obviously you'd still look exactly the same as you did when you uh, started. So people had to be fashionable when driving their cars, what sort of luxury items would people wear? For the ladies the top hats would have been sort of plumed with feathers. We also did fantastic um, coats such as the Siberian wolf coat which was an extremely extravagant and uh, almost yeti-like uh, coats that would have been quite striking. So Dunhill provided not only the clothes and everything but accessories for the car as well. We have many objects from the um, that we found through the early catalogues. Uh, by 1904 we were selling about 1300 different motoring accessories. 1300? Yes, wow. quite a few. So yes. I've just got a few items here so I just put the old white gloves on. The first object I have is um, something called the Bobby Finders. Bobby the Policeman? Yes, Policeman. Oh, wonderful. In 1903, Alfred himself was actually caught speeding. And um, he was so mad because the policeman was hiding in the bushes, dressed, you know, very casually. And um, so he kind of thought, oh, entrapment. So he brought in something called the Bobby Finders in store. Well, the passenger would have placed it um, over their head and it would have magnified um, their vision probably by about 10, so they could see um, half a mile off. Now, these are reproductions, so uh, can I have a look yes, at them? Yes, by all means. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> I can't see a thing. So I wouldn't find any Bobbies, I'm afraid. <laughs> but that, that's extraordinary. Um, also we have is this wonderful face mask, Ooh. which is um, quite shocking. Oh, it's a ghastly colour. I don't think I'd wear it. But she's got a hole for her mouth so she can be a backseat driver. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, isn't it? Now, I've got my hat and a scarf. So I want your, your opinion as to whether I've got it right. So that, you see, it's a, it's a good one, isn't it? Yeah. Now, the scarf on there... And Dorothy says in her book, always twist the scarf so that the knot stays in place. You see, she's so practical. There we go. Let me check in the catalogue and see if we've got it spot if on. I, if I've got it right, please, yes. I need to know. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm beginning to feel like a fast lady now. Dorothy's advice on motoring outfits all makes perfect sense. You had to be really prepared to set out in your car in those days. Now, 
I think I'm ready to go. I've got the outfit, the car, and Dorothy's handbook. But before I do, some De Dion enthusiasts are going to give me a send-off. And they're going to do it within the hallowed portals of the Royal Automobile Club. Now, I'm going to recreate Dorothy Levitt's journey from London to Liverpool in a De Dion Bouton. Any tips, Nick? Gosh. Um, well, try and stay out of the traffic. Um, on the A5, I think you've got to keep to the inside lane because you'll be doing 25 miles an hour and the rest will be doing 50, 60 or 70 miles an hour. You've got to stay well clear of any traffic in front of you because if they brake quickly with their modern brakes, mm. you've got to think well in advance. Where's the handbrake? Where's the foot brake? Do I have a foot brake? No. Boop. Do you panic, James? You have to find some small gaps sometimes between the cars. And is this easy? They sometimes part their way, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I should call you Moses. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you choose a De Dion? I chose a De Dion because it was chosen for me from the family. But uh, I love driving them because you can go along slow on roads, you can look over the hedges, and you can look into people's gardens and see some awfully interesting things. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've got some lady drivers here. As a woman who drives a De Dion, what do you think is the greatest problem? Clothes, things like that? It's very cold on a 1903 car. There's no windscreen, there's no roof, there's no heating. <laughs> <laughs> you can, well, you can get the little um, foot heaters that you can put hot water in and, and stuff to keep you warm. Oh, how lovely. But they tend to slide off the car and end up banging down the road. <laughs> Of course, before a journey, and particularly an epic journey like this, it was quite customary for a mascot to be presented to the driver. And on this occasion, I thought maybe it would be appropriate for this little black dog to be presented to you to help you on your way. That's jolly nice of you. Thank you very much. Of course, Dorothy always drove with her dog, her Pomeranian called Dodo. That's right, her little black Pomeranian. And she got a bit of stick for that. She certainly did. The Hereford Light Car Trials 1904, I think it was, she was presented with a bouquet by Selwyn Edge. And then the next day, in parody of this, um, all these little dog mascots appear on all the other cars from all the other competitors, you know. They were really taking the Michael. Well, Penny, from the greatest of all the early car manufacturers, we here at the De Dion Bouton Club would like to wish you all the best on your epic journey from London to Liverpool and back, we hope. Thank you. Thank you. Fingers crossed. Thank you. Dorothy set out on a dull and windy morning at 7 o'clock on March the 29th from outside the De Dion showroom in Great Marlborough Street, London. It's early, but the traffic is already heavy. When Dorothy was here, there would have been mainly horses and carriages about and only the odd motor car. I suspect getting out of London in a veteran car is going to be quite a challenge, but thankfully, Andrew is here to help. Morning, Andrew. Oh, good morning. What a disgusting day. Yes, um, you're going in the deep end today. Where's the roof? Well, I've, I've covered that, actually. I think you'll like this. An umbrella, thank you very much. Very necessary. It's one of those. Grand. What do I need to do before I well, go? Well, obviously, before you make a big trip, you've got to pack everything and make right. sure you've got all the tools that are going to keep you sustained for the next 10 hours on the road, as Dorothy did it in. Yes. So, in the back of the car... Yes, what else have I got? We have for you... Well, we've got, obviously, tyre, yes, inner tube, yeah. tools, your bag. Gladstone bag, and it's full right. of goodies. Fine. And then you've got fuel, because yeah. there's no petrol on the way. Understand. Uh, and then you've got your blanket. Anything to keep me dry? Yes, we've covered that as well. We've got you a present. Which is a modern Macintosh. How wonderful. Can Let you hold that? that? And I'll put it, I'm going to put it on immediately. <laughs> And you'll have a set of goggles as well. Goggles to boot. How lovely. Grand. And you'll cut a lovely dash. I'm going to drive you out of London. Please. Uh, and then I'll get you to Regent's Park and then you're on your own. Thank you. <laughs> so you get in the car. Right. Whip that back. I'll whip that back. And Fuel on. Neutral. Retarded. Uh, shall I switch it on? Switch it on, please. Right, I know how to do that. Down is on. Fingers crossed. Right. Choke. Oh, wonderful. Right. We're in gear. Handbrake on. Yes. And a rep, so away we go. Right. Thick. 
Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. There we are. I'm glad I didn't have to drive through the trap. It stopped raining. Hooray. Hooray, hooray. Over to you. Fine. Thanks very much. I know where the brake is, and I've got my hat. Right. Has anyone thought about the congestion charge? Oh, well. This is it. Liverpool, here we come. At a gracious but still bone-shaking 20 miles an hour, Dorothy would have left London and travelled through St Albans and out into Buckinghamshire. The Fangio of the A5. Comfort certainly wasn't a selling point a century ago. Just getting from A to B was the best one could hope for. Everything is controlled by levers. And there's only one pedal. You need three arms to drive this thing. Dorothy pioneered some very important changes to the basic design of early cars by adding some feminine touches that we now take for granted. Take the rear view mirror. We don't even think about them today, but back then they didn't exist. Dorothy told her readers always to carry a mirror. Most of them did anyway. And to use it, to see what was behind them. And then you could always check your makeup. Nothing's changed. By 1910, the mirror was starting to be commercially produced. So Dorothy really was ahead of her time. The arrival of the motor car wasn't welcomed by many. The roads were uniformly bad, and clouds of dust, roaring engines, and the acrid smell of burning oil accompanied most cars. A lot of people just didn't like the new invention. Our love-hate relationship with the motor car might have changed, but it's been there since the beginning. Motorphobia was a hatred of people who went about in motor cars and behaved badly in them. By the turn of the century, motor cars could travel at an average of, say, 25 miles an hour. This meant that people tended to scorch. Down they rushed in a cloud of dust, covering everything with filth. The way they dressed, you know, men often in goggles, um, which are frightening, looking like aliens, you know, sort of peak caps and um, just a lot of noise and dirt. Vickers became extremely exercised uh, by the behaviour of these carbarians. And there was a lot of sort of writing to the time saying that uh, um, these people were limbs of Satan and that they came, sort of, had been spewed out of the mouth of hell. An unwelcome intrusion into rural and urban life. There was deep resentment about this, which developed into a re reaction against motorists. There was an, one instance, terrifying instance, of somebody stretching a wire across a, a road near Windsor, which would have decapitated any motorists. There was a baronet, Sir, Sir Ralph Payne Galway, who approached a magistrate to see if, if he could protect himself by carrying a gun to use to shoot motorists with. And so Punch picked up on this, and round about 1903, they were publishing pictures of cars with armoured bodies uh, so that the motorists could drive down the high street and protect themselves from the marauding pedestrians who they believed were out to shoot them on sight. One of the earliest places that Dorothy would have passed through on her way up to Liverpool was Dunstable in Buckinghamshire. In 1905, Dunstable had a thriving motor vehicle industry. And the old Sugarloaf, an old coaching inn, where travellers like Dorothy would have stopped off for refreshments, is still plying its trade today. Motoring quickly became not only a source of new business for inns, but also a subject for popular culture and a target for satire. And I'm going to meet an expert in Edwardian Music Hall, who happens to be making a pit stop here too. Look, you can still see the old coaching inn inscription on the wall. I'm very interested in the music hall and, of course, 
The music hall artists were always looking for new songs to sing about, so they were delighted when a subject came along, something was new, and they were always prevailing upon the songwriters, let's have a motor car song, because it's topical, it's of the day, really. Did everybody love motor cars? Not at the beginning, they thought they were nasty, noisy, smelly things, which caused problems in interfering with the actual horses. I mean, one of the songs, uh, it's all you pee with the poor GG, now we've got the motor car. Oh. The poor old horse will disappear, excepting one or two that we'll show as a novelty to people at the zoo. So you've got the splendid photograph. Who is this? Harry Tate, who was a music hall performer, and he thought, well, let's have a gimmick. And so he thought of having a sketch about a motor car. And of course, he was amazed how successful it was and long after the originality of the motor car had gone, Harry was still doing his uh, sketch, you know. He goes, oh, well, half an hour, we'd be down in Portsmouth, which, of course, was completely illogical, really. And totally illogical today as yes. well. Where are you off to? Well, I'm just going down as far as Portsmouth to take my son back to the Naval College. Oh, that's funny. I'm going to Portsmouth too. Well, why don't you join us? I can't very well. I've got the wife and family with me. Well, bring her too. There's plenty of room here alongside of my son. Just move those bottles of wine and put them under the table. Don't trouble, man. Don't trouble. I'll meet you down there. There were songs about women drivers too, weren't there? Yes, not very many. And this is the first one, O Flo, and it's rather interesting because it was sung by Florrie Ford. Florrie Ford. Uh, I know that name. <laughs> yes, that's right. O Flo, why do you go riding alone on your motor car? People all say you're peculiar, think you love, so you are. Oh, Flo, do let me go. I'll be your guide. There's room for two, me and you, on our elegant motor car. I think it's rather nice on. They had to clamber on it. They couldn't go in through the doorways in those days. A little bit of history in the song yes, there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's lovely. God bless her. So, what was interesting about this? If you look on it, it says, chosen from the melody of Funiculi Funicula. And uh, songwriters liked to use songs or music that was already known because it was half the battle to get the of audience course. to join yes, in. Yes, of course. And if we look at the chorus, puffing, snorting, so <laughs> peculiar, <laughs> people <laughs> shouting, they don't know where they are. They <laughs> laughed at us, they <laughs> laughed at Pa, they laughed at me, they laughed at Pa. Oh, when we went to Brighton on our famous motor car. <laughs> <laughs> they all seem to go to Brighton. <laughs> Not Dorothy. From Dunstable, she probably passed through Fenny Stratford before reaching the jewel of Milton Keynes, Stony Stratford, at around 9.38 a.m. Although Dorothy managed the entire journey from London to Liverpool without any breakdowns, she wasn't so lucky on her journey home. She had problems with her foot brake and was forced to fix a broken water pipe on the way to Stony Stratford. Luckily, Dorothy always recommended that a lady motorist should travel with a huge toolkit. It's an exhausting list and includes a jack, pliers, carburetor, an oil can, an injector, a tyre pump, spark plugs. Wait a minute. I don't even know where the water pipe is. I'll leave that to someone who does. I can adjust the handbrake. Let's see what Dorothy says. Half a turn, one way or the other, if the brake is too slack or too fierce, usually suffices. Here we go. Half a turn, one way or the other. That way. Yeah. <laughs> Nowadays, we rely on organizations like the AA when we break down. In fact, 1905 was the year in which the AA began. And one of its first duties was to help early motorists avoid speed traps. The local police forces saw tremendous potential in uh, trying to, to set up speed traps so that they, they could prosecute motorists for speeding. A police officer would hide with a stopwatch and watch a car go by which he believed to be speeding. Breakaway organization was founded called the AA, the Automobile Association, and it took a much harder line against police traps and tried to expose them. 
They were like a sort of burglars association, you know, sort of warning against the police. What the AA did was to engage boys called scouts who would watch out for a speed trap ahead and would then see the oncoming car. They would see the AA badge on the car and they would then flag the, the motorist down and alert them that there was a speed trap ahead. And there were other mechanisms that people used, lovely mechanisms, like, for example, throwing coloured confetti on the road when there was a speed trap impending. Speed traps and limits never deterred Dorothy. She was done for speeding on many occasions. And woe betide any animal who got caught in her headlights. It was survival of the fastest. As she wrote in her handbook, it lies with drivers to keep clear of pedestrians, but dogs, chickens and other domestic animals are not pedestrians. And if one is driving at regulation speed, one is not responsible for their untimely end. The age of roadkill had well and truly begun. Next stop on Dorothy's route, Toaster, the oldest town in Northamptonshire. On her way to Coventry, Dorothy would have passed the gates to toast a race course. But I'm going to make a little detour. My ignorance of all things mechanical is not hereditary. My great uncle, Gurney Nutting, was a coach builder. He did a great deal of work for Rolls Royce in the 20s and 30s. Some of the cars the royal family used at the time were built by him and his team. To find out more, I've come to Hunt House, the Rolls-Royce Enthusiast Club, here in Toaster, to talk to its curator, Philip Hall. There we are. <laughs> Turn the engine off, have it in neutral. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely Good lovely. Morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Lovely Good morning. to see Good you. Angel. I've taken oh. a detour from my journey to Liverpool to come and find out about my great uncle. Yes, John, John Gurney Nutting. Yes, yes, yeah, indeed. yes, indeed, yes. He designed well, various Rolls Royces, didn't he? He did. He, he, he made some of the most elegant motor bodies uh, in, of the 20s and 30s, yes, many of which were on Rolls Royces. So do you have any photographs to show me? Yes, this is a picture of a car that your great uncle built for the Prince of Wales, who later became King Edward VIII. Now, this is fascinating because my mother who is now dead, yes. told me that she and her cousin, my Aunt Moll, who was my godmother, went to Great Uncle Gurney's works in Chelsea and sat in that car. Really? Yes, really? yes. And yes. they thought that was terribly yes. exciting, of course. <laughs> well, it's a 1928 Phantom One. Phantom. And it's the first uh, Rolls-Royce that uh, he bodied for royalty. He didn't actually build the Rolls-Royces, did he? Uh, no, just the coachwork. Before the war, Rolls-Royce never built any bodies themselves, just the chassis. That is typical of the great style that Gurney Nutting bodies had. I mean, that really is the ultimate of elegance. It's that in... wonderful sweep. Absolutely, yes. I mean, Gurney Nutting's team, John Blatchley on McNeil, would have done sketches for a potential customer, and he may have said, well, that's, that's fine, but I'd like the back swept out a bit more, or the waistline lowered, or something like that. I remember Blatchley telling me that someone actually wanted red upholstery. Which one? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> That's yeah. so kind of you. Thank you very yes. much. I love this one. That was fascinating. I'm feeling more confident as we get back onto Dorothy's route towards Coventry. Dorothy didn't have to cope with overtaking traffic. Nor them zooming past you that way either. <laughs> Bring back horses to the farms. Dorothy advised women to take a range of gloves out on the road to cope with mechanical breakdowns. And so she came up with the name we all use now, the glove compartment. Dorothy believed every lady motorist required two essential things. Fine chocolates, such as violet and rose creams, and a revolver, so a single lady could protect her honour. Nowadays, the gun is illegal, so um, the chocolates will have to do. Mm. 
Dorothy didn't encounter any perils on this particular trip, and the press reported that she arrived on schedule in the city of Coventry at exactly 11.36 a.m. I've decided to stop off here to meet curator Steve Bagley from the Coventry Transport Museum. I think I've taken a wrong turning. Hello, Steve? Am I in the right place? He's an expert on how the city became the home of the British motoring industry. Steve. Hello. Hello. <laughs> now, I've, I thought I'd taken a wrong turn. Where am I? Well, you're actually on the site where the British car industry first started. When? Well, in about 1896, and a factory on this site in Coventry, uh, a factory opened. It was an old cotton and spinning mill, but it was open especially to build motor cars, and it's the birth of the British motor industry. And what was the car? Well, there was a Daimler car, was the, how we'd know them today. There was lots of other sort of car companies within that factory, but the Daimler car was the most important that was made. Really? So who owned all this? The founder and owner, I suppose, was a man called Harry Lawson. And Harry Lawson was um, a shady entrepreneur. Basically what he did, he tried to buy as many patents for motor cars in Britain as he could. So if you wanted to build a motor car in Britain, you had to go to Mr. Lawson. Unfortunately, that business failed. But although he was this shady businessman, he did start the motor mills, which right. really did become the city's biggest industry uh, as the 20th century progressed. So you've got some photos of yes, what I it have. was like? Oh, I have indeed, yes. Lots of pictures of the motor mills right. from the period when it was first opened and when it was, when it was working. This was the factory that was on this site, and as you can see, lots and lots of workers standing outside. Yes. And you can see there was a fair few of them, not thousands, but hundreds. Yes. A lovely one of the rather posh, mustachioed yes, gentlemen sitting in their vehicles. Because, of course, you'd have had your chauffeur, of course. wouldn't you? Yeah. you? You wouldn't sully your hands. And, of course, I suppose things went wrong, and your chauffeur mechanic had to mo Motor men, as they were often called motor as well, motor men. <laughs> this one is quite interesting because... At the time that Dorothy was making her journey, this building would have been standing, and it's the offices that were built around the motor mills for the Daimler Company. So when Dorothy would have come to Coventry, she would have probably have seen these buildings if she came down this way. Gosh, how lovely. Soon after Dorothy had left Coventry, it was time for lunch. She stopped in Stonebridge, most likely at the luxurious Stonebridge Hotel. She was a girl who liked the finer things in life after all. And this is it, a stretch of dual carriageway on the A452. The hotel was knocked down in the 50s. Now, the choice is between a quick burger and chips at the local carvery or a posher bite at the golf course. I think I know which I'll go for. Is it in the budget? Meriden, the center of England. Oh, it says that. Fortified by a fine lunch, I'm ready to head north again. Let's hope the car behaves. Dorothy firmly believed a woman could and should maintain her own car without the help of a mechanic. But when it came to changing tires, she had some definite advice. Don't, if you can help it. Dorothy knew a woman could do it, but she wrote, not one woman in a thousand would want to dirty her hands doing it. And I certainly don't. Dorothy says, I need a good mechanic to do it. And I found one. Rodney, how difficult is it to change a tyre on this car? Well, we'll have to take the wheel off and take the tyre off and put the inner tube that we have there. So, driving from London to Liverpool, about how many times do you think a car like this would have to have a change of tyre? Well, tire? it all depends on the condition of the road, but there are a lot of horse... Uh, nails all right. scattered all over the road. So how difficult is it for a woman to change a tire? I mean are the nuts very tight? Well we've got to undo all the nuts here, take the wheel off and then set it on the ground and do the job and then and, put it back again of course. And of course she would have had all these tools to do it? Oh yes you had to carry all the bits and pieces with you. And was it hard for a, a lady to do it? Actually, no, man? but I'm sure there were plenty of chivalrous gentlemen around. So will you show me how it's done? Gosh. Can you hold that's, that for me? Yes, Thank indeed. Thank you. Gosh, that's dirty. She, of course, had gloves, especially in her glove compartment, for such an eventuality. I don't. 
wheel off as that easy as that yes then you'd have to change the inner tube yes so we've got to take this off and put the new one in wow and that was the problem a and horse nail straight through the inner tube yes indeed and we'll get you going again very quickly Fine. i'll leave you to it All done and ready. Thank you very much. Now I can be on my way. You certainly can. Thank you. As she got closer to Liverpool, Dorothy motored through some very picturesque locations. Places like Lichfield and Nutsford. The inspiration for Elizabeth Gaskell's Cranford. Nowadays it's the traffic that gets you down. But in Dorothy's day it would have been the dust, the noise, and marauding vicars. In this car, you really feel you're travelling. Somewhere between Church Lawton and Nutsford, the unthinkable happened. Dorothy got lost. She certainly didn't have a sat-nav, nor did she have an AA map. They weren't around until 1910. Remember, Dorothy was only using the Contour Road Book, which is not easy to follow, I can tell you. People got lost an enormous amount, and that's why reading a map was regarded as extremely important. Though I think reading a map must have been very, very difficult. No, there weren't road signs, and there weren't road markings either, so you didn't know. And obviously there weren't cat signs or any of those things. It was really a pretty hazardous thing to do, actually, to drive. There were great areas of the country where motorists were constantly stopping and asking pedestrians how to get to the next place. The AA did start to put some signs up near known hazards, such as dangerous hills or dangerous junctions, but otherwise there was no formal system of, of signs which was understood throughout the country. Dorothy, resourceful as ever, managed to get back on track. But then, whilst in Warrington, her petrol ran out. In those days, there were very few places to get petrol, but there were some, usually chemists, and you had to keep the water topped up as well, so that's what I'm going to do. It's in her book. Behind the engine, close to the dashboard, you have to unscrew the top and top it up with water. So here goes. Hmm, I think that should be enough. I wonder if they sold sandwiches with fuel in those days. You'd had to get your petrol from chemist shops or haberdashers. Harrods sold petrol. I mean, there was just an extraordinary lack of a provision for the motorist. Around about 1900, though, the, the two-gallon container, the two-gallon tin drum, was created. And this is where the emblematic shells and Pratt's tins, where their origins um, came from. You were a travelling petrol station on your own. You had to be because there was nowhere to, to buy it. Petrol at the time was about a shilling a gallon, which would have been very expensive. And motorists tended to try to, to work out how much their car was costing to run per mile. Dorothy's target was to get to the Adelphi Hotel in Liverpool by dinner time. And as she was heading towards the city, she was able to put into practice a lot of the hints she'd included in her book, such as how to behave in traffic. She says, ladies are usually bad at judging distances, and it is as well to keep towards the middle of the road as possible, and not to try too many near things, until you have reached the expert class. Good advice. I try not to get near anything when I'm driving. And like Dorothy, I believe in good manners on the road. That didn't, of course, mean being shy of using one's horn. Dorothy advised its clear and loud deployment. By early evening, Dorothy and her de Dion reached Liverpool. The 
Empire Theatre. Good evening. City of Culture. Dorothy had covered an incredible distance of almost 205 miles. Lime Street Station. They're all going to the pantomime. Mm, let's get going soon. Why don't the lights change to green? <laughs> she reached her destination at the Adelphi Hotel just after six o'clock. Dorothy had achieved her goal, the longest run accomplished by a lady driver to date. And the Veteran Car Club of Great Britain is here to greet me on my arrival. That was an incredible journey. Of course, it would have been impossible for me to do the entire trip in a de Dion like this, but um, I've got a jolly good idea of just how challenging that journey must have been for Dorothy on primitive roads and in a bone-shaking machine. She was certainly braver than me. Hello. Hello. Welcome to Liverpool on Thank behalf you. of the Veteran Car Club of Great Britain. That's very nice of you. Oh, how lovely. Thank you very much indeed. I believe you have an article about Dorothy Levitt to show me. Yes, it's um, the Liverpool Daily Post, and it tells me that Dorothy arrived at 6.10. About the same time as now. So what happened when she arrived? Well, Dorothy's car was inspected by a Mr Kelly, who is a motor engineer, and I understand that the, the Dion was in perfect mechanical condition. It's extraordinary when you think she'd travelled 200 and some miles yes. in 10 hours to yes. get here and yes. looked after it herself. Yes. Well, it's so kind of you to come and meet me. Thank you very much indeed. Hello. That trip to Liverpool was just one of Dorothy Levitt's accomplishments. Her reputation as a racing driver grew quickly, as did her celebrity status. A French magazine from 1910 shows her taking on new challenges as she enrolls for flying lessons with well-known aviator Hubert Latham. But the trail then goes cold, and it's not clear what happened to her after 1910. One thing is for certain, Dorothy really raised the bar for the motorinas who came after her. I've come back to Brooklyn's museum, home of British motor racing. It's actually full of women. Many have raced here in the years since Dorothy Levitt's time, even Barbara Cartland. As well as writing hundreds of romances, she and her friends took great pleasure in speeding round this track. It's been great fun. I think we've proved that women can drive as well as men. <laughs> Dorothy understood that the motor car could free people, especially women. She took risks proving her point, but she gave us all the opportunity of being girl racers, if we wanted to be. Now, I've been Dorothy at 20 miles an hour, so I think the time has come to shift up a few gears. Take it away, Chris. <laughs> Can a retail pioneer by the name of Portus bring about change in charity shops at nine after Springwatch next on BBC Two? While it's the stuff of myth and legend on BBC Four now, Michael Wood delves into the epic poem Beowulf 